progressive, the independent there, talking about an issue he has talked so much about in his political career, uh, the minimum wage and the rights of workers and laborers you see there, some of the signage, looks like UAW folks are on hand as well there in Cleveland, Ohio. All right, let's move from Cleveland. We have this uh, pretty cool live vantage point there on the field at Rickwood Field in Birmingham, Alabama, the game between the Giants and the Cardinals about to kick off this tribute to the Negro Leagues uh, ever so prescient in the wake of the passing of legend, Giants legend, I should say, Willie Mays a couple of days ago at the age of 93. We've been on that story as well, remembering that incredible life as well here. Also, one more live vantage point we want to bring to you as well. This one in downtown Houston. Uh, there are a lot of major crime stories happening there, but uh, a really sunny shot there, uh, kind of juxtaposed with the shot we brought you this time yesterday. A lot of wind, a lot of rain, some of these effects from tropical storm yesterday. Alberto now tropical depression. Alberto there as well. Uh, speaking of pleasant scenes here, we'll leave you this, with this last one on the beach there in Santa Monica, California there right near the pier. Uh, in the meantime here, we do want to kick it off uh, with something that we have been eagerly anticipating, and that, of course, is the Supreme Court ruling on the case of presidential immunity regarding former President Donald Trump and the case brought by Special Counsel Jack Smith, the January 6th federal election case here. So we didn't get a ruling today. Maybe we'll get a ruling tomorrow. We want to talk about this even further with our friend, former federal prosecutor and legal analyst, Nima Romani. He joins me. Uh, Nima, good to see you here. I know you have your eye on this, as we all do, um, but it didn't come today. Uh, maybe it'll come tomorrow here. We are just at the Supreme Court's whim when we're going to get this ruling, right? That's all it is. That really is all it is. And we've been waking up, me, pretty early, 7 a.m., checking that Supreme Court docket is today the day. And some of it's just guesswork, but the decision has to come by the end of the court's term at the end of the month. And obviously, we're talking about a historic decision that may not only affect Donald Trump, but presidents for decades to come. And it's such an important decision. And the reason we all thought maybe it's going to come today is we saw some security in front of that Supreme Court. We saw some barricades, some a beefed up uh, security presence there. And we know that no matter what the justices decide, it this will be a controversial decision. There will be protests either way. So in anticipation of that, we thought maybe it's going to happen today, but it looks like it might be tomorrow or even next week. So, you know, Nima, as this usually goes, uh, we get all of these rulings in the month of June on really big issues and topics here. But from what I understand and from what is being reported, um, the justices have a lot still to release on their docket. Shannon Bream, Fox News Sunday anchor and host uh, who covers the Supreme Court and has for years, she says this, we're still awaiting several big cases from SCOTUS on presidential immunity, guns, social media censorship, abortion, federal regulations, and more. Opinions are coming 10 a.m. Eastern Friday, and the court has just added 10 a.m. Eastern next Wednesday as well. Almost guaranteed the court will add additional days, 19 cases still, Nima, unresolved. We're almost in July. This is unusual, is it not? No, highly unusual, and historians and you know, those that have been following the court have pointed out that this is the slowest Supreme Court since, I believe, 1948. Never in its term in nearly, what is that, you know, 75 years has the court taken so long to decide so many of these cases. And they're very important cases. We're talking about the gun case, the Rahimi case. It could have major Second Amendment implications. Can those who have domestic violence restraining orders, can they own firearms? There's a huge case that came down today that could have completely overhauled our tax system and ended up not doing that. But even there was a big drug trafficking case today from one of the agents that I used to work with oh, wow. that allows us, Andy Flood, who allows prosecutors like myself when I was a baby prosecutor to bring in evidence about how these drug trafficking organizations operate, their structure, and that they don't use blind meals. These are decisions that will affect prosecutors in every case, in every courtroom in this country, of course. Obviously, they don't have the constitutional and historic significance that the Trump case does, sure. but they're all very important, and they're going to affect 
millions of Americans, whether it's social media, whether it's abortion, free speech, I mean, these are all very important decisions. You know, Nima, um, two years ago, we're almost uh, on the two-year anniversary of the Dobbs decision. And correct me if I'm wrong, but in that season, uh, that was the last ruling that came down in the docket from the justices. And in the two years since, in that interim, it was seeming like there was this conventional wisdom forming that the justices save their most important rulings for last. Does that hold up? Is that actually true? I don't think it's actually what happens, but obviously okay. in the Dobbs case, that was unique. The opinion was leaked. The Trump case too, I mean, that's something that they squeezed in. We know that Jack Smith tried to fast track that appeal. It was rare for a winner, a prevailing party, to want to appeal a ruling in his favor. He tried to do so to get it in front of the Supreme Court as quickly as possible. They said no, but the court did decide to fast track that D.C. Circuit opinion that held that Trump was not immune. So just in terms of timing, it was also the last decision to be put on a calendar for this Supreme Court term. So would it be surprising if it was the last? And like you said, it's going to be a contentious decision. The justices yeah. said, this isn't something that's just going to affect Donald Trump. This is going to be a decision for the ages. It's going to decide, can presidents be prosecuted or not? All right, Neva, let's uh, put kind of these logistical and timing questions aside. Let's get to the crux of the case, the ruling that we are waiting for here. Presidential immunity. For viewers just coming to this story, yes, you and I have discussed it countless times. What's at stake? everything. I mean, Trump has argued that he is absolutely immune from prosecution. And that was when the judges in the appellate court famously asked if, you know, the SEAL team comes and they assassinate your political rival at your direction. Are you immune? And so, I mean, obviously Trump has taken a very broad view of immunity. He himself has said, I can kill someone in the middle of New York and be immune. I don't think the justices will go there, but I think they will give some form of immunity. Now, the question is, does Donald Trump fit in that box? A lot of people are speculating, a lot of lawyers, a lot of uh, appellate gurus, that the justices will say the following, because of the way they phrase the question presented. There is immunity for official acts. There is no immunity for personal acts. Was Donald Trump's conduct leading up to January 6th? were those official acts? Was it actually just investigating or auditing the election results? Or was it campaigning, in which case it might be personal? So we're really going to see a test that's laid out by the justices. And then the second question is, are they going to answer that question? Are they going to answer that test and say, right. Trump falls in the box or does not? He's not immune. Or are they going to kick it down to the lower courts to make that ruling? And if they do, of course, we've talked about it not just substance, the procedure matters a lot. And if this is delayed by weeks or months, it's going to push this all past the November election, in which case we may never see trials in any of the three remaining cases against Donald Trump. Well, you know, um, to your point, Trump has taken quite a broad, expansive view of this. He says any president needs absolute immunity essentially for all time, both while they are president uh, and in the post-presidency as well here. But we don't know how the justices will come down on this. Let's game out some of those scenarios, though, because I think you might agree with this. This court has really been loath uh, to rule uh, in vast sweeping quantities. They like their narrow, limited rulings, don't they? Can we get that tomorrow, maybe? Maybe, but I think that's unlikely. I mean, oh. uh, the narrow ruling would have been the D.C. ruling that said, Immunity does not apply to former presidents, period. So okay. Donald Trump, we're going to dismiss your case because you're no longer president. Now, I don't think the justices are going to buy that argument. They're going to give former presidents some form of immunity. They're concerned for a political tit for tat and retaliating against one's rivals. So then the question is, you know, what sort of line are they going to draw? And we know that this set of justices, they do like qualified immunity. They're not going to give blanket immunity to Donald Trump. That actually hurts themselves. That's essentially Donald Trump saying, if I'm president, I'm not even subject to any judicial review whatsoever. No judge can decide whether I'm breaking the law or no prosecutor. So I don't think they're going to do that. But I don't think they're also going to say that immunity doesn't apply at all. I don't think they're going to take that broad 
easy sort of step that the appellate justices in D.C. took. So I think they're going to draw some sort of line, and this is based on the questions that the justices asked during the oral argument. They need to create some sort of rule because now that this box has been opened and prosecutions are becoming much more common, even if Donald Trump becomes president, he said that he may seek prosecution of some of the individuals that went after him. So sure. I think the justices are thinking three steps ahead. They want to make sure that whatever standard they set applies to not only Trump, Biden, anyone who's sitting in the Oval Office. So Nima, can you get this ruling on the question of immunity with or without the question on the public versus private acts here? Can, can you get one without the other or, or do we have to get both? I think you're going to have to get both because I don't think there's going to be a blanket immunity or blanket no immunity. If they're going to want some sort of line where there is, there has to be some immunity. This is something that um, even Democrats, you know, would be concerned about. You know, can you know, folks like Bill Clinton and Barack Obama be prosecuted for some of the alleged war crimes that have happened. I mean, I think the answer to that is no, there has to be some immunity for presidents. But when does it go too far? When is it something that's really outside the scope of the presidency and someone just acting for his or her own personal benefit? So I believe there has to be and there will be some sort of test. It won't be blanket one way or the other. So once the justices draw that line, who's going to be the one to determine whether that immunity applies or not. I mean, we saw this a little bit with the Section 314th Amendment argument where the justices came in and said, well, if you engage in an insurrection, you can't hold public office, but you can't just be a state court judge in Colorado or a secretary of state in Colorado and decide right. who's on the ballot or not. We know what the rule is, but we also need to know how and who is going to enforce this rule. Do you think we'll see any surprises with the justices themselves in their arguments on this question? Or, or is it going to be completely uh, along ideological partisan lines 6-3? Uh, are you anticipating unanimity here, 9-0 or not? Is that far-fetched? 9-0 would be surprising what we saw in the abortion case. Right. I don't think it's going to be on ideological lines because even the cases from today, we've seen some strange bedfellows with conservative and liberal justices joining together in majority and dissenting opinion. In, in the drug case I mentioned, uh, Justice Gorsuch was in the dissenting minority opinion, even though he, he tends to be a little bit more conservative, obviously a libertarian. Um, and even in the tax case, you, you know, again, certainly didn't go the way folks thought it would when we had a 7-2 majority on a very important tax issue. So I wouldn't be surprised if the three liberals are really narrow in their immunity. But, you know, there are institutionalists like the Chief Justice sure. and other, you know, uh, other justices like, you know, Barrett and Kavanaugh, they, they might care about just the rule of law and the integrity of the court. So I wouldn't be surprised if we have a much larger majority opinion than folks anticipate in that case. Yeah, and on these big cases and questions, and, you know, you might agree with this sentiment there, Chief Justice John Roberts uh, historically has acted as somewhat of the moderating figure on the court, uh, a la kind of Anthony Kennedy, so to speak here. Um, Nima, before we let you go, that's one of the cases brought by special counsel Jack Smith. You were indicating that uh, it's potentially not going to go to trial at all this year because it's been so delayed. I want to go to a piece of news on the other case brought by special counsel Jack Smith. The New York Times today, Nima, had this exclusive uh, saying this, Charlie Savage, one of the reporters on it, saying, when Judge Eileen Cannon drew the Trump classified documents case, two more experienced judges in Florida's Southern District, including its chief, urged her to step aside and let someone else take it. She obviously insisted on keeping it, and she still has it. That's Judge Eileen Cannon. This is the Trump classified documents case. Nima, um, have you ever heard something like that happening with uh, judges speaking amongst themselves? urging one of their colleagues, hey, don't take this case for whatever reason. Andrew, I have not. I've been doing this more than 20 years and this amazing reporting by the New York Times. I don't know how they got this information, but you have the chief judge there in the Southern District of Florida telling Judge Cannon, essentially, I think you're in over your head. You don't have the experience to handle a case like this. And sadly, I think she may have been right. I mean, that oh. case is moving at a very 
slow pace. Judge Cannon is entertaining a lot of arguments that, frankly, I don't think a lot of other judges would. She's moving the case slowly. Okay. We have no trial date on calendar. And, you know, if you're a judge, whether it's Donald Trump or anyone else, you need to handle your docket and move cases along. And it's just not happening there. So um, it's a lot for any judge, but especially one with as little trial experience as hers. So I think in hindsight, maybe, just maybe, those two more experienced judges were right. Okay, yeah, yeah. You have to imagine what... Jack Smith thought when reading that report today there in the New York Times, uh, he's kind of been rankled by a, a lot of Judge Cannon's, you know, motions and entertaining a lot of these filings from the Trump legal defense that he thinks are somewhat out of bounds here. It's interesting, nonetheless, a great exclusive there in the New York Times. Nima Romani, as always, thanks so much. We'll talk soon. Of course. Thanks, Andrew. All right. In the meantime here, let's take a quick commercial break.